UNESCO's World Heritage Programme has undoubtedly been successful. There are now, in 2016, around 1,052 World Heritage Sites. The vast majority of those still remain in Europe and North America, though. So the question is to be asked, whose World Heritage is this? Which world are we actually talking about? If we were being generous about World Heritage, we would say that its success is due to the way it promotes clear management plans and structures for dealing with issues around World Heritage Sites, potential World Heritage Sites. If we were being less generous, we could say that World Heritage is more about place branding. In other words, nations who have to nominate sites choose to promote some sites over others, some historical periods over others, sites belonging to particular groups rather than others, in order to promote certain places and spaces for either international tourism or nationalist majority identity narratives. And if we're taking that view, World Heritage is popular for all the wrong reasons. I say all the wrong reasons because actually when we look at the way World Heritage works for tourism, it very rarely seems to do so in favour of local communities. And I could cite a number of examples. Most of Tanzania's World Heritage sites, which I know very well, serve an international safari market, but they very rarely serve the local communities that live in and around them. Things have changed a little bit recently with Ngorongoro conservation area, but broadly speaking, we can make this generalization. The World Heritage Project works through a committee that has practices that are rather opaque. In other words, quite often the choices as to what actually becomes World Heritage are open to political processes big countries pushing little countries to vote for their particular nominations in a bit of back scratching. Too often we see that rich countries mobilise their resources in favour of presenting the kind of heritage they want to show to the world. And as part of a place branding exercise, this seems to be very instrumentally, mostly done for international tourism. This is not necessarily in the favour either of local communities or local community economies, or necessarily in terms of representing their particular pasts. So a broad analysis, for example, of sites that are on the World Heritage List because of their ancient values will show you that most of those sites ignore other histories and other stories, especially from the more recent past. In other words, we're privileging one set of historical values over another. So the popularity of UNESCO's World Heritage then is in its malleability in the way that particular nations can manipulate it to represent their ideological views of the world and also their place in the international world order. Whilst I'm broadly critical of world heritage, we should note that it has moved beyond its earlier Eurocentrism. For example, world heritage was criticised in the early days for being really a list of churches and castles. That changed in 1992 when they brought in the cultural landscapes uh, designation. This was specifically in order to get countries from Australasia and from the African continent to be able to nominate sites as they were considered to have less built heritage. Then in 2003 UNESCO diversified further by including intangible practices, beliefs and performances as a kind of world heritage and this has enabled a much bigger diversification of the kind of things that can be considered global patrimony. In reality, though, it's quite hard to see how listing objects and practices and beliefs actually helps preserve them, partly because, of course, they are now so very numerous. It's hard to keep a handle on what actually is or isn't heritage, or perhaps everything is heritage. Mm -hmm.